to our webinar on using machine learning on logs to find root cause faster. My name is Matthew Wright. I'd like to uh, introduce some of our speakers today. We have Larry Lancaster, the founder and CTO of Zebrium, Aran Khanna, the co-founder and CEO of Reserved AI, and Gavin Cohen, our VP of product here at Zebrium. So Gavin, uh, we'll start with an introduction of the technology followed by Larry, who's going to run through a live demo of Zebrium. And then we will hear from Aran, who will tell you about Reserved AI, one of our uh, amazing customers here at Zebrium and the experience they have using Zebrium in production. And then if there, if there are any questions, please use uh, Zoom's Q&A function and we will try our best to answer all the questions at the end. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Gavin. Thanks, Matt. And hello, everyone. My name is Gavin Cohen. So what you can see on the screen is a web app that I've set up, a microservices demo app on a Kubernetes cluster on my laptop. Now, the catch is I've actually broken the app. So let's see what happens. I'm going to click over here. And sure enough, we're seeing an issue that where the app is broken, as I told you. So now the question that I want to ask everyone is, how would you find root cause? Because we've got kind of a cryptic message here coming back from the web server. We know the app's broken, so what do we do? And the first thing that you would probably do is you'd have some kind of a monitoring app. In this case, I'm using Kiali to keep an eye on my Kubernetes cluster. And just like I saw with the, the cryptic message that came back from the web server, the dashboard here is also indicating that things are broken. But just from this, and even if I drill down, it wouldn't tell me the root cause of what happened. So like everyone else, the next thing that I would probably do, or you would probably do, is start to dig down on the logs. So let's fire up our, our log manager and start to figure out what happened. How do we do this? Well, everyone has their own techniques, but it's probably some combination of what you see on the right-hand side. So I would probably start off and zoom into a time range where I thought the issue had started, and I'd look for some error or warning messages. And depending on what I see, I would then scan for anything that was unexpected or new or rare around it in the logs. And if there was a very large number of logs coming from a large number of microservices, as is the case with this app, this would be kind of a laborious process. From there, depending on what I find, I would start to explore around there and piece together a sequence of what happened and then leverage luck, intuition, experience, help, whatever I could do. And hopefully with enough effort, this hunting would, would yield a picture of, of the root cause and what led to it and led to the problem and the app going down. But this is, as everyone knows and everyone who's done it themselves, this is a really difficult process to go through. So let's fast forward and imagine if you had a machine learning system that could really mimic what me or you as a human could do. In other words, it could identify root cause automatically without the hunting. It could also, because it's be able to recognize these kinds of patterns, it would be able to proactively find things in the, the logs and the metrics without hunting, once again, without setting up rules. And if this was done correctly, it wouldn't require any kind of complex setup or training and would achieve accuracy very quickly. So now that's a very bold set of claims for what machine learning could do. But in this case, we're going to run, hand over to Larry for an example of what Zebrium finds. And again, just to set the scene, this is the same demo app that you saw that I broke. And to cut to the chase and hopefully not spoil the demo, what I actually did is I logged into the Kubernetes, Minikube Kubernetes node, and I ran a little C program that continually allocates one meg chunks of memory until it exhausted all the memory on the, the VM that's hosting 
the entire Kubernetes cluster, which of course causes the app to fall over. But that's a tricky thing to find if you had to just manually hunt through the logs. So let me hand over to Larry now, and he's gonna give you a demo of what Zebrium picked up while I did all of that. Hey everybody. So uh, trying to share my screen, let's pray for the best. All right. Okay, so uh, so this happened yesterday. Uh, so so Gavin ran his demo, and so you know, uh, as a Zebrium user, you would have gotten a notification in your community Slack channel, and any other places that you've set up for notifications to go. Um, uh, so we have a number of sort of integrations as well as sort of a generic webhook for that purpose. Um, but but basically, you would have gotten something that that looked a bit like this. Uh, it would have had this uh, this sentence: "The system was running out of memory, and the and the OM killer was invoked." Um, and, and then and then it would have it would have some log events. Now you see when I'm lo looking at this uh, report in the list of of reports for my system, uh, you know I see these two lines brought up as kind of a, a quick summary of that of this event uh, of this uh, incident. And then I'm going to drill down into it. Uh, and see and see more of the details, um, and and yeah, I, I I gave I gave us five stars, so I'm not sure, maybe that's cheating. Okay, so so let me let me just go ahead and and, and dig in here. So essentially, here's the idea. I'm, I want to explain kind of the idea of what Zebrium is doing, um, you know, behind the scenes and and what's the purpose. So <clears throat> I look at it as I call it sort of the general or the um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of junior SRE problem, right? So the idea is this, you start, you, you come into, in, into a, a place and you're kind of, you start, you start working on the monitoring, um, you know, you, there, there may be a number of sort of tools that help you figure out when something's broken. There may be issues that you've confronted before that there's some automation around identifying, uh, but, you know, let's, let's say there's, let's say it's a new issue, right? And so with the complexity of deployments today, um, as well as the frequency of releases, it's not unusual that there's a new issue. And this, this is kind of, this is kind of causing MTTR improvements to stall out. Um, even elite teams can't automate for unknown issues, right? So junior SRE, you know, is starts working, uh, you know, with a particular stack. And what's going to happen is over time, they're going to get a sense of what's normal, you know, and what's rare, as well as kind of what's bad, right? And so those two things, rareness and badness, are really important concepts. Um, and so essentially what, what Zebrium uh, does, uh, you know, much, I'd say much better than anyone has, has ever been able to do it, but kind of our strength, is to be able to figure out what's rare. Um, and, 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 and that basically requires you know, at ingest, always having, you know, sort of the, your current understanding of, of the catalog of possible event types that are happening. Uh, and so based on that, we can, we can pick out rare events and we call those anomalies, but that's really not our product. That's not what we deliver. To us, that's kind of a feature extraction. The next step is where we look at these anomalies across your different log streams and we build a model that we parameterize a model based on your data that essentially understands how, how often is it that you have correlated anomalies across these streams uh, and what correlated means in the context of your stack. And when we see too much correlation, uh, according to some uh, naive Bayes model that, that we parameterized uh, to, to, to have occurred by chance, we create a root cause report out of it. It's really that simple. It sounds simple and it is simple, of course, the devil's in the details, but now you have a sense for where these, the, these events are coming from. So, so what you'll notice is that the first one here uh, is something that was logged uh, into the kernel log by the boutique uh, test service. This is the service that did the, that did the out of memory test. Uh, and you see it says, the, it says the system will run out of memory. It's important to understand that Zebrium has no understanding of words like memory or CPU or disk file system. It has no understanding uh, you know, of particular kinds of issues that can happen with Kubernetes in particular deployments or you know, 
given applications or Apache or, or Postgres or Redis or whatever. It has no, there's no understanding. It's a purely statistical model so that you don't have to worry about having sort of connectors. You can use your own app and it'll understand the statistics of that app. So, so this is interesting and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about this in a moment. Um, the second event you'll see here, uh, you know, is, an, is the SSH uh, command that's, you know, kind of starting the test. Uh, and then uh, the next event you'll see is the OOM killer being invoked on this OOM test app. Um, and then uh, you see a bunch of other events that got pulled in. Uh, and and this, this event here, this purple one, uh, is, is supposed to be a symptom. Uh, and in fact, it is a symptom request timed out. So this was happening because obviously we were running the system out of memory and everything kind of got, you know, frozen for a bit. Um, and so <clears throat> what you're seeing here is, you know, without without any sort of knowledge of the stack or the app and, and any, or any training other than feeding in the data for a couple of hours so that we have, have kind of an understanding of the statistics of the app before breaking it, uh, we were able to, to, to produce this report automatically and notify, um, notify the administrator. So that's kind of Zebrium in a nutshell. And it, it sounds at, at once, it kind of sounds like magic, but then it also sounds, when I explained it, I hope it sounded kind of simple what we're doing. It's just, I think we do a really good job of it. So what's interesting here is if you look over here on the left, you'll see some metadata associated with this event. Um, and uh, like, let's say I said, oh, this is actually a valid incident, right? Let's say next time I want to, you know, I want to notify, you know, someone by email. I can put in, I can check next time this happens, give me a, a default, use the default email. I can also add integrations in here. So I could, if I've set up PagerDuty or Ops Genie uh, I, or, you know, other Slack channels, I could put those all in here and say the next time this happens, go into this work workflow, go into a P1 workflow, a P3 workflow, I could do that. Now below here, we're, we're starting to see a little bit more uh, sort of structure around these log events that got pulled in over here to the right. So you can see the different uh, services uh, or log types, depending on if it's a host log. Uh, you can see the different events. If I mouse over it, you know, here's the OOM killer one. And you can see uh, it's showing me the text of the events to, that are over here to the right. Um, the other thing that's interesting here is sometimes you may have, you know, a lot of stuff that's, you know, valuable here to the right. You may, you may be missing the one thing that you wanted to see, or there may be more detail you want to see. In that case, you can hit related events. And essentially what we do at that point is, you can see all my those events I had before in red, green, and purple, and all, there's all these new yellow ones. And these are kinds of other anomalies uh, and errors that were happening around the same time. It kind of helps me get more flavor to the incident, right? Um, so I'm going to go back to core events. And then finally, um, you know, if you deploy us into Kubernetes, you can deploy us in, in pretty much uh, any environment, uh, you know, we can pull out of, you know, an elastic stack, we can do, we have Linux and Docker co collectors, um, but it's, you know, by far the easiest way is Kubernetes, if you deploy our log collection chart, you can also deploy our stats collection chart. Um, and what that does is it, it deploys our um, uh, Prometheus scraper, as well as some default node exporters and, con and uh, container exporters. Uh, that essentially let, lets us pull in basic metrics and correlate them to the incident. So you see here, there were a couple of stats anomalies that got pulled in uh, associated with this incident that was created, um, including a couple on, on memory. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, finally, I'll point out that, you know, kind of the point of Zebrium is to make it really easy to understand what happened. Um, you know, without a lot of effort. Now, if you're kind of, you know, a Linux, uh, you know, guru, you'll know what the OOM killer is. Um, but, you know, you may not, you may be, you may be the junior SRE, it may be your first day on the job. Uh, I don't know, this may, you may have gotten this, uh, you know, this notification because you're filling in for someone. It doesn't really matter. There's all kinds of, in, in any given app, there's going to be stuff you know and stuff you don't know. 
So one thing that that's uh, an experimental feature, but we do offer it to everyone at this point, is we take this set of events. You see, this set of events that got pulled out of the logs here is very terse, right? We're talking about somewhere between 10 and 20 events, and that's kind of generally what you should expect from us. So with something that, that that's that compact, we could create a natural language prompt out of it, and we could pass it into a language model like GPT-3, um, and, and then we'll take back what the system says is a summary of this to the right, and we'll put it into this, this sort of description up here. So at, what you're seeing here is without any understanding of the app or any training or any connectors or any parsers or anything uh, like that at all, uh, we identified uh, you know, a new issue. Um, we alerted on it. Uh, we also put together a root cause report uh, and we created a natural language description of it uh, without any supervision at all. And so really that's kind of the, the, the vision of Zebrium and, and you're seeing it play out here with this, with this demo. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead now and, and introduce uh, Aran uh, from reserve.ai. It's, it's an amazing um, sort of uh, cloud cost management solution. Uh, and he's gonna talk a little bit about his experience with Zebrium. Hey, Aran. Awesome. Thank you so much, Larry, um, for the awesome demo. Uh, so just to give a little bit of background on Reserved AI, I'm the co-founder CEO, and what we enable customers like Zebrium and a lot of other large customers running on the cloud uh, across Azure and AWS to do is actually proactively forecast and manage cloud resources in a completely automated way. Uh, so we actually enable folks uh, running across these very complex uh, multi-cloud deployments to do things like commitment management, cash flow forecasting, tax optimization. Um, and uniquely, we actually buy back overcommitted resources from customers, essentially making a market, but really on the granular level, integrating with tons and tons and tons of different APIs from you know over 300 APIs in the AWS land, uh, 200 APIs in Azure, um, a ton of different APIs coming out of the Kubernetes clusters that we're monitoring for cost and attribution. And what we really found, um, obviously the installation is quite simple, but the backend software is very complex. What we really found was that given this wealth of data and the wealth of systems running in Kubernetes built on top of that, uh, that there were things that were constantly changing um, within the underlying uh, primitives that we're essentially pulling from on the Kubernetes side, on the Azure side, on the AWS side. Um, and while we have this stack running, each component was generating tons and tons of logs. And when there was an error, not even an, an error on our side, often an error on the vendor side, um, or even on the customer side, as things like IAM roles change, we were not able to very easily go in and get the actual root cause of that out the other end, either forward to our engineering team or a customer success team or a sales team, what have you. And what that really meant was that our critical engineering resources as a startup, we like to move fast and build things on behalf of our customers, uh, but they were getting waylaid, you know, once a week at the very least going through all of these different types of uh, kind of debugging procedures to find root causes. Um, and even worse was the fact that a lot of these root causes, just because we you know, took the tact in many cases, like the out of memory case, just throw more resources at it, just kind of ironic as a cost optimization company. But um, you know, given that a lot of them actually went unnoticed until the volumes exploded to the point where we really had to look at them. So that was sort of the state of the world before. And when I heard about Zebrium, honestly, you know, I, I was a little bit skeptical, right? And I think my engineering team was too. We use machine learning as well, but we use it in a much more sort of staid way of, of doing predictive models, um, expected value calculations, and uh, actually doing risk modeling and market making on the back end. So those are all sort of established things that folks on Wall Street, for example, have been doing for years. This was something that new. So I was very, uh, let's say interested, but skeptical around if this could replace the, you know, specific DevOps knowledge that was needed before to really go in and figure out what was going on with this wealth of data um, kind of streaming in and the error sporadically showing up. So this was essentially something that we decided to kick the tires on 
And we started the free trial with the Zebrium folks installed in our Kubernetes cluster. It was pretty quick. Uh, actually, I was able to do it as you know the, the semi-technical CEO, which was a testament to how easy it was. I didn't even have to pull up my CTO or my DevOps folks into the conversation. And literally in the first week, AWS had a API change. If you build on sort of the long tail of AWS APIs, you'll know what I'm talking about. They'll just change shit all the time and not tell you about it. Um, if you're not on S3 or EC2, for example. And because we're built on that long tail and we have a number of systems there, uh, this was actually a really important thing to catch because uh, had this not been caught, if a customer went to a certain page, this would have caused you know a complete error and a service disruption essentially. Uh, so this was what sort of piqued my interest and said, hey, this, this starts to make sense. Um, I think it's kind of working here. It's seeing that there is an error that we wouldn't have caught if we weren't looking at the logs. Um, and as we sort of dug into the system, as Larry was showing before, we actually saw that the correlations and the root causes were really pointing to the exact system, to the exact sort of uh, pod in this massive array of different services uh, that was causing the underlying error. So it actually led to a faster resolution on our side. So at that point, you know, we were we were starting to buy in a bit, and you know, as and that was sort of you know last year essentially as we were scaling up. And we've been running with the system for over a year now. And as we continue to run with it, we saw that, you know, the things that were being caught here were consistent. It wasn't just a one and done. We were consistently as we were building and seeing issues from our customer side, from the vendor side, getting these reports in our Slack channel with Zebrium. And, you know, this is an example right here where the customer actually had issues with their account where they were messing with an IAM role. And we were basically unaware of this entirely until we probably got a complaint from the customer that would have been the forcing function. But because of Zebrium, uh, we were able to get the Slack alert and we saw that the customer was essentially messing with the role and had this big issue and we were able to escalate to our customer success team proactively, which is something that's fantastic as a business owner myself. I love when we can surprise and delight customers and get ahead of issues without them having to, to fall, you know, essentially fall on the sword and come and tell us um, that they screwed up. So we were uh, really delighted by the fact that Zebrium was not only helping us with kind of the state operational pieces of our cloud infrastructure management, but really helping us surprise and delight our customers. Um, with the fact that we can really get ahead of a lot of these issues in this complex environment without our team having to build very sophisticated kind of internal monitoring tools. This was very much a plug and play. And, and this is sort of a more recent thing as Larry was showing, but um, you know, usually when Zebrium sends an alert, I'm just shooting it along to my engineering team and say, hey, go look at this, go look at this. But now I can actually start with these NLP summaries that are coming out to figure out for myself, hey, what's going on? Do I need to just shoot it to my CTO and have him uh, you know, route to the right person? No, often I can actually understand because of these natural language summaries, um, you know, even as a CEO of the company, what the errors are, who is responsible, you know, who is the owner of that piece of infrastructure and really have a much more targeted loop with them. And even now our dev team is starting to um, look at these and much more quickly route them to the right place and easily understand the uh, sort of underlying root causes that we're seeing in these stream of errors that uh, we get from Zebrium. And this is something that, you know, I thought was absolutely science fiction before I saw it live, because as you saw in the demo, the logs to, you know, to anyone who's a layman or even a, you know, a sophisticated engineer, it's, it's kind of nonsense, right? It's not really well structured. So the fact that these natural language summaries uh, were able to be generated with such high fidelity and, you know, very often, right? I've not seen a lot of cases where they're wrong. They're very often very spot on. Um, that was something that really was a, a big draw for us to lean further into this system because of the fact that, you know, they seem to be making the impossible possible here. And it really delights our engineering teams and helps us delight our customers in different ways, either through reducing the downtime uh, with faster resolutions, uh, but also helping them debug issues of implementation and integration on their end with our systems. So kind of a 360 degree view of the Zebrium product 
was really um, important for us to get over the year to see how it could help us um, as it developed, not only move faster on an engineering basis, but really on a customer success basis uh, as well. And I think that is something that I didn't even expect when we first integrated with the product, but I was obviously delighted to see as we moved down um, the path of integrating them further and further into our workflows. Hey, so thank you. Thank you very much, Aran. It was um, very helpful to, to hear that from a, a customer because as you know, as a vendor, when we say things, it's it's really a, a vendor speaking, but it's it's super helpful to hear about your experiences, particularly that you're one of our very early customers that have been using it for quite some time. So I'm gonna just continue on and we'll we'll keep this very short. But I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about how our machine learning works. Larry, who, who wrote the um, original pieces of this in his, in his garage, literally before Zebrium was funded, I'm going to take you through that. And then um, we'll, we'll switch over very soon to q and I've seen quite a lot of questions coming through. But let me just go over at a high level how the ML works. So it starts with us collecting logs and metrics. And I saw one of the questions in the chat actually said, you know, what did the look, logs look like before we filtered them? So remember, we're not filtering them, we're picking out the, the root cause. In that scenario, there were probably somewhere around a million log, raw log lines that, that came in, of which we picked out about 20 or so of them that indicated the root cause. But anyway, the, the logs and metrics come in. Let's look at what happens with the logs first, because that's by far the most complicated and, and critical piece of this process. As you know, most logs are messy and unstructured, or maybe they have structure, but lots of different structures within the same log. So we assume nothing. We're happy to take logs really in, in any kind of format at all. And the key thing that we do initially, and this is where a lot of our IP is invested, is we essentially learn how to parse and structure them for the purpose of being able to extract variables within those events, but more importantly, to be able to accurately categorize each type of event. So if you think about a busy system where there are millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of log lines coming in every second, we're essentially turning them into maybe a thousand different unique types of events so that we can categorize them and then <clears throat> move over to the next layer of our machine learning, which essentially learns the patterns for each type of event. <clears throat> so as we see more examples, we can continue to refine our model, but essentially very quickly, we can learn the patterns for each type of event. So what that means is when each new event comes into the system, we can score it based on how anomalous it is. So if it's expected and it falls into pattern, it'll get a very low anomaly score. But as Larry was saying, if it's a very rare or maybe an event that we've never seen before, it'll get a very high anomaly score. Or if it's an event that breaks frequency or periodicity patterns, similarly, it'll be scored accordingly. <clears throat> now what this results in, is essentially the extraction of, of anomalies, so the features in the data. However, this is a noisy signal because the logs are noisy. There are always anomalies in the logs. So we couldn't just rely on this to do accurate root cause detection and incident detection. So what do we do now? And this is really the, a, a key piece of our machine learning. We look for hot spots of abnormally correlated anomalous patterns across the log streams. So in number two, we've scored everything based on how anomalous it is. We then look across all the log streams and we look for non-coincidental correlations of these anomalies across all the log streams. And this now turns something noisy into something that stops becoming sort of coincident, you know, kind of just coincidences into something that where we have very high confidence that there's a real problem going on. So we group together this set of 
um, you know, clustered anomalies. And then we look at the metrics. So we look for any, any correlated metric anomalies that fit into this same time period. So now that means we don't have to worry about specifically tagging the metrics we're interested in. We can look for any metric anomalies that correlate with what we've just found. And we pull all this together into what you saw earlier in the demo into a root cause report. And as you saw, the root cause report then traces through kind of a history almost from the root cause, the very start of what happened through to the symptoms and the, the impact that that may have had on your application, plus any metrics that helps to corroborate what happened. And then you can rate the incident and you can decide if you want to be alerted in the future or if you want to ignore them in the future and so on. So this whole process is completely automated because we assume nothing to begin with. It's all learnt as we go. And there's zero manual training in this process. So you simply feed in your logs and metrics and within a small number of hours and certainly within the first day, we start to build a very accurate model and become useful. So let's look at how you use this in practice. There are two use cases. And the first is what we, we talked about is, is finding the root cause. So this is when a problem occurs and you want to know what happened, what was the root cause. Now, if you have an incident management tool like Ops Genie or PagerDuty or Slack or anything else, then we can automate the entire process through our integrations. And the way this works is you might have a monitoring app that detects the problem. Maybe it detects that the latency is too high. So it creates in number one, a PagerDuty incident and then completely automated PagerDuty in number two, sends Zebrium a signal to say, fetch the root cause for this incident. And we'll scan or have pre-built a root cause report that in number three, we feed back to that PagerDuty incident. And the net result is a user who clicks on the pager incident, PagerDuty incident without even going to the Zebrium UI gets to see our root cause summary augmented into the original incident that was opened maybe by a completely different monitoring tool. So this is how it works if you're using an incident management tool. If you're not using an incident management tool, as was the case with what Larry demonstrated, then when you have a problem, you simply go to the Zebrium UI, you look at the root cause report summaries around the time of the problem, you read the NLP summaries or the, the events that are displayed in the summary, and you drill down to any that look relevant, and that should yield root cause. If you don't see what you want, there's a button called scan for root cause. And when you click on it, it essentially uses that as a trigger signal to say something happened, go and fetch that set of anomalous correlated patterns around the time and come back to us with what you find. And this turns out to be a really, really simple way of figuring out root cause when something goes wrong. The second use case, and this is something that most of our customers are doing, and you heard Aram talked about it as well, is Zebrium is always scanning the data, looking for these clusters of anomalous patterns across your logs and then pulling in the metric anomalies. So it's always building them. And although you don't necessarily want to be paged and woken up in the middle of the night because we found something, because of course, we can always find things that are not critical problems or maybe you upgraded your application and a whole lot of things are new sort of anomalous patterns. But essentially, this gives you a really good mechanism for detecting new failure modes and proactively catching things that maybe you're not aware of. And you heard a couple of examples when Aran talked earlier. The cool thing about this is, and in your own time, you can scan our list of root cause reports proactively. And if you see anything interesting, you can drill down and then take whatever action you need. But we see many, many examples in real life of this catching real problems before they start to become critical incidents and, and take down systems or impact customers. So finally, a lot of people sort of wonder, you know, what are the things that Zebrium can detect? 
And the answer is, it really can detect almost anything that would be visible inside the logs. We are not pre-programmed to detect anything specific. So there are no rules, there are no pre-built things that we were looking out for when Larry showed you the demo earlier. There was no rule inside Zebrium to say, look for an OOM killer message from a kernel log and correlate it with an events log that says the pod's been um, deleted and so on. It's simply picking up the patterns. So this slide shows some examples that we've seen in real life of things that we've caught, and it spans a huge range of things from application and system bugs to orchestration issues or issues with um, Kubernetes or whatever platform you're running on, lots of infrastructure and network problems we've detected, inter-process and inter-service interaction issues, middleware issues with the database or the queuing layers, and even security issues. So we've actually caught certain security incidents and shown the root cause of things that the security tools missed simply because the security tools weren't looking for that kind of a pattern. And we caught them because we saw these them as these anomalous clusters of changes going on in the logs. So I hope this has helped to explain what it is. And what I'm gonna do, I've seen a lot of questions. So I'm going to hand back to Matt, who's gonna read out the questions and then between Larry, myself and Aran, we'll, we'll answer with, as much as we can. Anything that we don't get to, we'll respond by email when we um, send out the summary at the end of this. So with that, Matt, if you could please run through the questions. Awesome, thank you, Gavin. Let me start with uh, some more of the questions that are that have uh, that are being asked in common. Um, does uh, does this solution need to be deployed on premise on the server itself, or or do you need to ser do you need the server to publish the logs externally where the solution runs? Maybe um, Gavin or Larry, if one of you want to take that one. Uh, yeah. So, hey, it's Larry. So, um, yeah. So we. So if you go, if you sign up for a service, um, you know, you'll you'll be put into a page that kind of shows all the different collection options. But but basically, um, you know, typically there's going to be an agent deployed. Um, however, there are sort of generic um, sort of ways to access our ingest APIs for those use cases where it doesn't quite fit with an agent. Uh, you know you don't want to deploy an agent. Uh, also, you can kind of fork out of log stash. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, so, but when you get to that point, you know, if you sign up and, you, and you're looking to get logs in, you'll, you'll be given a menu of things. And if, if something's confusing or if you have a question, just shoot us an email, we're happy to help. Okay, and, and since you mentioned log stash there, there's another question here that I think uh, is a good segue. Uh, probably for Gavin, how does this work if I already have Elastic? Yeah, sure. So we sit either as a standalone product, and Larry didn't demo this, but there is a full-blown log manager built into our tool that has all the usual search and filtering and alert rules and so on that you can use as a log manager. But we also have a mode that we call augment, where we augment someone else's log manager or monitoring tool. And in fact, with Elastic, we've actually integrated with Elastic in two ways. One is without touching the endpoints, we can actually take a feed of the logs directly from Logstash. So you don't have to touch any of the, or reconfigure any of the endpoints, but you simply um, create an output plugin to, to Logstash, which would forward a copy of the logs to Zebrium. We then go through all our ML, and when we detect something, we actually publish it back to Logstash so that you can visualize it even inside Kibana. So we've built a little Kibana canvas that you can use where you can see the root cause reports that we detect. So it does work really nicely with something like Elastic if you're already using it, or in fact, any other logging tool, as long as we can get a copy of the logs and hopefully the metrics as well in the Kubernetes environment, that's all we need to be able to augment the other tools. Gavin, given a log bundle, can the solution parse the logs retrospectively 
and determine RCA. Yeah, this is this is Larry. Um, so yeah, it, you know, so once you've solved the ingest problem, uh, so yeah, I mean, we'll we'll just load that we'll load that data in. Um, I you know I think by well, so I, there's a yeah. So by default, what'll happen is I think we'll look for incidents as much as two days or three days into the past. Um, but if you know if there's some special case, just shoot us an email and we can always we can always uh, you know help you get what you need. Okay. And and Larry, I'm going to try and combine two questions here. Um, can you explain how you use GPT three and how much did you have to tweak it to make it work? Uh, Larry, if you're uh, if you're talking, you're on mute. Yeah, there we go. Hey, sorry about that. Yeah, so um, I was actually just typing a response to that. Um, yeah, I'd say like the like to, you know. So we took a stab at it with some with some some Da Vinci prompts. Um, it brought you know, it probably took you know a few weeks to start getting something reasonable that we could kind of have a limited, you know, a limited sort of beta, you know, so basically then we were working with individual customers um, who were willing to give us feedback, you know, on the summaries, because a lot of times it's going to be about, you know, their app. And so, so whether or not it's relevant is, you know, going to, going to require, you know, feedback from the person who's date, who's putting the data into the system. Um, so, so that there was that period. <clears throat> uh, and then, and then, uh, you know, when we, when we felt it was, you know, kind of decent, but it's by no means perfect. Uh, we added it in for everyone as an experimental feature, and we're now working on the next sort of version of it. So, so really our, you know, what's our, our strength is being able to find the right few lines to stick into the prompt, right? Um, uh, but, but given that, now that we've kind of, you know, taken a first step at leveraging that, the next is to kind of look at different ways of asking for that you know, output different models and so on. So, so we are going to, we are planning another release of that um, uh, imminently. And, and I think it'll, I think it'll make, uh, you know, I think it'll please everyone who's been using the, the feature. So mm -hmm. keeps getting better. Okay. Uh, this one looks like it's for Larry. How much training does your tool need and how long does it take for your ML to work? Uh, yeah, so there's no training required. Um, so essentially, we're just, um, you know, we're basically estimating parameters of a model. Um, and so, you know, we, we know how we want to do that, we, we go about it. Um, what you can do is, um, you know, once you start, so, so really kind of in the two modes Gavin mentioned, right, one is just looking for root cause because you know something happened, and there's ways to get the fact that something happened into the system, um, different ways to do that. Um, but there, there's really, there's really no, you know, there's not a lot of uh, sort of feedback there required. Um, for the proactive detection stuff, you can basically say, oh, you know, this was, this particular, you know, notification wasn't very interesting. Oh, this one was, you know, five stars. And, and that, that'll get reflected, you know, in, in either, you know, similar inc incidents being notified the next time, um, or else um, giving us feedback on, on the ML. And, and how long does it take to work? I mean, there's really no fixed cutoff. Um, you know, we, so the data is structured at ingest. At any given point, we have kind of our best understanding of the model, our best guess of the model of the data itself, um, the structures of the, of the logs. Um, so that's all kind of kept current at ingest, but to, to, to estimate the parameters of the correlation model takes a little bit of, it takes a little bit of time generally. So, you know, in the first, I don't know, hour or two, you know, it can be noisy, um, you know, for, you know, sometimes even, even like for the first four or four to six hours, maybe you're getting, you're getting a few more than usual in general. Um, you know, if you're looking at the proactive detection stuff here, you know, from day two and onward, you, you should be looking at, you know, no, no more than two or three a day. And that's a, for a very no, noisy kind of stack. So, so I, you know, like that demo, like, actually, let me share something, uh, Matt, I'm just going to share this, um, 
Ooh, is someone else sharing? Okay, yeah. Let me uh, let me grab this here real quick. Let me show you something. Okay, uh, right. So so this was the report that we looked at, right? Um, so so now let's say I wanted to kind of you know, I wanted to view this this incident kind of you know in the context of other logs. I click the logs tab, and now I'm kind of going into log manager mode. Um, and so, so what you, what you see here is, you, you know, you see kind of a, it's a time merged sort of set of all of our, all the log events we collect collected. I'm going to pull this little tab down here. And what you're seeing here is kind of a histogram in time. This is the last 24 hours. This is when the test was run. You can see there's a total of 290,000 events that were, that were brought in and we're somewhere in the middle of those down here. <clears throat> um, so, so like in this case, you know, uh, this, this whole, you know, sort of ingest to, to, to being done with the test went from 1700 to 1930. So two and a half hours. So it, so it took two hours, basically, we, we ran the system for two hours and then we did the test. So, and it worked the way you saw. So that, that kind of gives you an answer, right? A couple of hours is fine. And, and while you're here, uh, Larry, can you show us what a log line looks like before our filtering? Oh, so I think I think what he was saying was when we were on the report, you see these guys with the yellow and red uh, sort of lightning bolt here. These were events that were in the incident that we were looking at. Um, so here you can see them represented in time by these little red chicklets here. Um, but then I've all, I've now unfiltered because I went into my logs view. Uh, and so I can see them, they're here, but but they're in the context of all the logs. So this is what all the logs look like unfiltered. And so the, here, here are the ones that we had shown just in the incident report earlier, but you can see all the rest of them are here. And then there's about 200, 290,000 of them. Okay. Uh, okay, I have a question for Gavin. You had mentioned Elastic. We are using an ELK stack. Uh, would this replace ELK? Yeah, so really it's 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 your choice. Um, that, as I was saying, you can use us as, as a complete standalone log manager as well. So if you take that path, it could certainly replace the whole ELK stack where you just feed from source all the logs straight to us and we'll do our stuff. Plus you can use us to do all your other log management functions. Or if you're well tied into the elastic stack, then just continue to use it. And we sit essentially to the side and augment. So we get our feed of logs. And then when we see something, we feed it back to, to um, elastic so that you can see it inside Kibana or even if you had a incident management tool or something else that you wanted to report to, you could use that as the central place that you go to to find the root cause. So either way works. The, the key thing that would steer you to Zebrium is the leveraging of the, the machine learning. For anybody that's interested, if you go to our website, we do have a blog also that compares the machine learning that we do, what Larry has built and just talked about, to Elastic actually has its own native machine learning, which is really um, a couple of different technologies around anomaly detection. But we do have a, a comparison of, of what we do versus them. And the biggest thing that you'll see is we generate these root cause reports. Most of these other machine learning technologies essentially just uncover anomalies and there can be thousands or tens of thousands of them, which don't always help to narrow down the problem as much as you would like. But um, by all means, have a look at our website and then we can, if you, if you leave your name, we're happy to give you a demo of how it looks with the Elastic Stack if you did want to integrate it or use it on its own. Okay. And, and Gavin, how does your licensing work? Yeah, so you can go to our website and look at the pricing page. It's very straightforward. Essentially, it's licensed around the volumes of logs that you send us. So it's capacity-based licensing. And there are two main tiers that you look at. There's an augment tier where we're not the primary log manager, where something else is, and we're sitting to the side looking for these proactive and, and reactive root cause reports. 
In that case, we only keep a very short history of data and you don't get all the, the log manager drill down that you saw Larry just showed. That's called the augment mode. And then we have the normal mode, which is we, where we're both. We do all the machine learning stuff and we also have the log manager and we keep longer retention of data for exploration and other purposes. But it's all pretty straightforward if you look at the website at the pricing page. Okay. And, and last question here. If I want to test your ML, how do I do that? <laughs> Just read, read the screen. Um, it's a, there's a free trial, a two week free trial that you get full functionality. So really it's, it's a, depending on your environment, it's, it's, it's about a two minute process to sign up and um, get to a point where you can install the log collectors. If you're in Kubernetes, installing the log collectors is a copy and paste of a, a couple of Helm charts. So it's, it's absolutely dead simple, similarly with Linux and, and other platforms is very easy to, to integrate. So it's just a few minutes to get started. Um, it is a free trial. And the alternative, if you're interested, we're always happy to give you a one-on-one -on -one demo. You can book that on our website. We do that a lot. We can answer any questions, but by far the best way to, to experience this is just to try it with, with your own data. We also have that same microservices demo app that I showed you. There's a blog that gives you sort of a recipe book for installing it and running through and breaking it and, and then looking at the results in Zebrium if that's of interest, if you don't want to try it with your own app. But it's very easy to get started. Wonderful. Well, uh, Gavin, Larry, Aran, thank you all so much for the amazing presentation. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of this. If you do have any questions, feel free to email um, us on, on the email you see here on the screen, or you can email me, matthew at zebrium.com. And we look forward to hearing from you if you have any other questions. And thank you all so much for attending today. Have a great day.